Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another live broadcast of the Engadget Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Devendra Hardwar. Today, I'm joined with our other, one of our many Senior Editors, Dan Cooper. Hey, Dan. How's it going? Hello. I'm doing pretty well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. I love your camera angle, Dan. Dan is replacing Sherlyn, who is off for uh, a couple of weeks for a well-deserved break. And also joining me is our podcast producer, Ben Elman. Hey, Ben. Non-senior podcast editor. Non-senior. Ben well, you're you're the only one, so you yeah. are the most senior <laughs> podcast. You're editor. chief chief yeah. podcast yes. editor. <laughs> you're the Emp- main guy. Yes, Emperor yeah. podcast editor Ben Elman. Oh, Hi, man. everybody. Well, Happy holidays. Hello. Happy holidays. Uh, this will be our you know, not last episode of the year. Technically, uh, we won't be doing a show next week just because it's Christmas time and nobody's going to want to be listening to podcasts. But we will pro- we will have an end of year episode right before New Year's, uh, probably previewing CS. So keep an eye yeah. out for that. Yeah, and that's the thing about covering tech. Like it makes the year <laughs> run into itself because it, the snake ends up eating its tail. You go to it CES like right after New Year's and. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's how you celebrate, I guess. Oh, man. Well, I just want to take a second to thank everybody for joining us in the audience. I see I see Mark Dell. I see Jaime or Jamie Avalos. I see Gabriel, J. Andrew, Poke Rob. Hello, everybody. And uh, a lot of people may have joined because of the, uh, the title of the show. It's going to be The Analog Pocket. We're going to be talking about The Analog Pocket with James True, um, our editor at large at Engadget. Uh, just so you all know, Analog Pocket Talk won't start until around 11 a.m. Just because James is <laughs> in Spain. Watch all the numbers just drop straight so off many, now. All down. Uh, James is in Spain. And it's also He's also super busy, so we have to like lock in the specific time for him. But we will be recording this episode out of order. Uh, Dan and I will be talking about other you know tech news and stuff first. And also, you know what? We're big Succession fans, and uh, it's our show. So we will talk about Succession for a bit, too. So that'll be that'll be fun. Yep. Find the tech angle on succession. Find the tech. I mean, it's right there too. Uh, but we also need, have to do it without talking about spoilers. So that'll be our challenge for succession. Yep. But also, you know, to uh, <laughs> what to spoilers to are it. there? They're rich and they're sad and they're constantly uh, fighting. Do you each watch other. the show, Ben? No. Do you watch the show? <laughs> no. then you, you wouldn't know. You would not know. Would not even know what Mr. Darcy did. Okay. <laughs> That's, I know that isn't a character. Uh, he, he is actually in the show, so yeah. I One still of can't get over Mr. the fact Darcy's. that, that mm-hmm. he's known as Mr. Darcy. Like that's what he's most famous for. He's been the star of like four TV series. Four TV, like MI Five. Yeah, we we will MI get 5. into all this. Yeah, yeah MI Five <laughs> is the big one. So anyway, this is a tech podcast, so we will be talking about tech too. And uh, I think Dan is always a fun gabbing partner, so that's why I wanted to bring Gab on. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Flint Dan says on. hi from Russia. Love Hello. to hear where everyone is tuning in from because yes. it is never just one country, and that's. That's what I really love about doing this live stream. We've had it. people from um, Indonesia. We've had people from the Philippines. We've had uh, Australia, people from yeah, yeah, at least ten or fifteen U.S. states. Still waiting um, for Antarctica. Where's Where's our <laughs> Antarctica? Yeah, they're, they're working on important climate science and also tuning into the Engadget podcast. They I have no idea their... when it would be for yeah. them local time. <laughs> don't know. But... I don't know how that works. Uh, but anyway. Uh, to all the new people joining us, we are going to be recording the podcast, so there are basically going to be sections where we can't really talk to you guys. Ben will be keeping an eye on the chat, and we will break in between segments for some audience Q&A. Um, and when James comes on after 11, we will try to get some time for him to actually show off the uh, the analog pocket for the audience as well. So Yeah, one more time. Yeah. If you are here to see the analog pocket, that's going to be a little while, but trust us this is a decent show it's worth your time <laughs> to show. truck through the all of the stuff to get to the analog pocket we're going to be talking about gadgets and um both real and imagined corporate malfeasance uh succession but also uh the audio only an audio only unit of the podcast is going to talk about a like some s- significant malfeasance at a metaverse company <laughs> can you tell us a little bit more about that Get people to tune into the audio show. Yeah, I mean, hey, Meta World. Uh, we had a great investigative piece by Jessica Conda about Meta World, and uh, apparently, this piece was like in the works for three or four years, like a long, long time uh, across multiple people who aren't even at the site anymore. So, uh, as you're listening to us, uh, go check out Jess's piece: How a VR startup took the money and ran to the metaverse. 
And uh, I also need to remember to shout out the interview we're going to have with Jess at the end of this episode. So we'll do that too. I'll basically do that in that section, Ben. Okay. And also when we do the wrap up. I'll well, you yeah, I mean, tuned. you can do that in that section and then I'll just cut that out and I'll actually put like Jess in there because we're supposed to be like, you want me to put her in the. No, well, really? I, th I think it would break things. That's why I mentioned it last night. Yeah, oh, okay. but it's OK. We'll we'll figure it out. We sure. will figure out where to put this interview, but there will be a chat with me and Jess um, kind of having her dive into this piece and kind of what it meant for her. But be sure to check that out. It's called How a VR Startup Took the Money and Ran to the Metaverse. Um, but yeah, I think we're ready to go. And I know Dan has a hard out. Dan will be leaving by 11. Yeah. Cool. All right. <clears throat> Thank you all for joining us. Let's get ready to go. What's up, Internet, and welcome back to the Engadget Podcast. I'm senior editor Devendra Hardwar, and today I'm joined with our other senior editor, one of our many senior editors, Dan Cooper. Hello, Dan. Hello. It's lovely to be here again. Hello. And uh, actually, hmm, hmm. Yeah, because we I'm would have gonna... James up first, yeah. actually. Okay. I'm not going to introduce you, Dan. Wait till Fine. the other news next Fine. Time, okay? Yeah, yeah. So you're Let me you're just, just this yeah. You're just going to say we're going to have Dan. We're going to have James yep. True James first. True we're going to have Dan Cooper. Dan Cooper, and yep. then yep, yep, yep. Make it okay. more <clears throat> What's up, Internet? And welcome back to uh, What's up, Internet? And welcome back to the Engadget Podcast. I'm Senior Editor Devendra Hardwar. Our regular co-host, Sherlyn Lowe, is off for vacation this week, so be sure to send her well wishes. This week, we will be diving into some really cool stuff, uh, especially the Analog Pocket, that really cool new portable uh, retro gaming device uh, that, you know, uh, do that again. This week, we'll be diving into the Analog Pocket with James True from Engadget, and that's the really cool retro uh, gaming device that just looks really cool. I feel like everybody wants one. And also, Dan Cooper will be joining me to talk about news and other fun stuff. So be sure to tune in for all of that. As always, if you're enjoying the Engadget podcast, please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. Leave us a review on iTunes. That's always super helpful. And you can drop us an email. And you can drop us an email at podcastengadget.com. We typically do a live stream Thursdays around 10 a.m. Eastern. So join us for that. Uh, you know, we do Q&As. We have fun times with the chat. Uh, just heads up, uh, we won't be doing one or an episode uh, during the week of Christmas, but we will have something right before New Year's to preview CES. Okay, so we will jump straight to other news. Okay. Let's move on to some other news. And joining me to talk about that is our senior editor, Dan Cooper. Hello, Dan. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Hello, it's always fun to chat. Uh, yeah, when Sherlin is away, Dan can play. I think that's how it goes, right? That is pretty much how it goes. Yes, I'm. <laughs> I'm, I'm. I mean, it's a one-to-one -one swap. I mean, it's seamless. There's almost seamless. no difference between the two of us in in any. Regard. I can't tell. I can't yeah. tell if I call you Sherlin during this episode. I'm sorry. That's uh, fine. But we we've got a bunch of news to dive into, and uh, you know, some fun stuff. So stay. You can do that. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Just go we've into got the first thing. We've got a bunch of news to dive into. Specifically, I want to shout out uh, a really cool investigative feature from Jess Condit at Engadget called How a VR Startup Took the Money and Ran to the Metaverse. And this is a feature that's been in the works for several years now. It's actually been, I believe it, it was started by Nick Summers, who used to work at Engadget. So, you know, it's a long running piece about um, Diedrich Reed, a guy who created this company called MetaWorld but also has created a bunch of other companies and uh, it's all been kind of a fraud. So it's a really interesting story to look into now that uh, metaverse is the, uh, the hype word of the year, I think. So be sure to check out the piece and we will be chatting with Jess about this um, towards the end of this episode. So tune in for that. Okay. And if we end up changing it, Ben, like we can just, uh, I'll change that wording if we need to. Okay. <clears throat> so there's really not too much news this week, uh, but one thing I want to point out is that uh, I was in New York last week, if you heard last week's episode, uh, to check out a Dell preview event where they showed off a bunch of stuff, but uh, some of the coolest stuff are these concept devices, and we've written up a couple of the, uh, we've written up a few of them. Um, Sherlin was really taken with the concept Pari which is this really cool thing. Like imagine you have a monitor uh, with a webcam at the top. And what if you could take that webcam off? What if it was a portable, what if it was a portable device 
uh, that you could just plug anywhere on the screen. What would that mean for video chatting? What would that mean for like collaboration with people? The idea from Dell is that uh, basically it would help you bring the camera down to eye level so you're actually having a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody on Zoom rather than an extreme camera angle like I'm having with Dan right now. So I just want I'm wondering like Dan, would a removable webcam like help your work situation right now because of uh, how we're talking at this point? I mean, you, you seem to take great issue with my webcam angle. I I mean, my laptop is on a stand, so it's nice to yeah. elevate it. Uh, my... In general, in general for photography <laughs> and video, low low camera angles, not so great unless you're dropping an album no. cover. So that, that's the main thing. But I'm, would you find I mean, this useful? Yeah, I would. I think the big issue, the big issue really is that you know, when a laptop's on a desk, mm -hmm. when when you look like me, especially, <laughs> you're always going to be shooting up at the least flattering angle. I mean, yeah. you know, you know, Huawei, obviously, they as a sort of security measure, put their webcams in a, in a kind of pop up key inside the laptop deck keyboard. And so essentially, it is the least flattering angle mm -hmm. you could possibly get sort of. So <laughs> basically, it's, yeah. you lead with your double or triple chins. And, and then everything else yeah. is just window dressing. So the ability to kind of move the webcam up a couple of inches, I mean, hell, it would be great to do um, video calls from like the MySpace angle mm -hmm. specifically. Um, but I, I do think that there needs to be a revolution in terms of <laughs> where webcams go, principally because um, they, they're not fit in terms of mm -hmm. how they're designed now. They're just not fit. I mean, what? fit for really how we live these days it would be lovely if you could change it you know and, and obviously the idea that you could attach it to the display so that it is sort of at your perfect eye level um i love That's obviously the risk the, the risk of having it detachable is that you lose it you lose it uh yeah. there could be issues i mean that the it means there's a limited battery life and there are other things to think about. But I think you bring up a great point, Dan, like we're relying so much on our webcams now. Um, <clears throat> we are waiting for some sort of like great innovation in this space. And I think what's really cool about this too, is that, you know, when we were talking to Dell and this thing, Concept Perry, it's just a concept. It's not a shipping product yet. Um, but the idea is that you could potentially have more than one of these. Um, if you look at our video of this thing, uh, Sherlyn has a Concept Perry on like an arm that's pointing down. And I can imagine when we're producing the show, you know, sometimes we want to show off gadgets and stuff. So if you had one camera on your monitor looking, you know, straight at eye level and another on a mount somewhere on your desk so you can actually show off devices or something on a table, that would be pretty cool, like juggling multiple cameras. Uh, I think given the way GoPros have kind of shifted the way people capture action, you know, footage on the go, we don't quite have something as nimble uh, on the webcam front. Sure, you could use a GoPro as a webcam. That seems like a really expensive solution to uh, to solving your webcam woes. Um, have, you, have you heard about the Opal, Dan? The Opal C1, which is the $300 camera that a lot of people have been talking about lately, too? Oh, is this the super fancy one? The super fancy one. Like yes. uh, Fast Company, Fast Company, Jared Newman at Fast Company wrote up this thing called, uh, the article's called, Would You Pay $300 to Look Better on Zoom? The Opal C1 is a camera with the 4K Sony image sensor. That's yes. the one that Dell also has in their current 4K camera. Uh, but the Opal also has like good microphones, uh, AI processing to make your image look better. Um, for 300 bucks, like, I, yeah, sure. I think a lot of people would do that because... Right now, what people are doing is uh, if you have an old <laughs> DSLR or yeah. an old mirrorless around, you mount it to your desk and you do some cable magic and software magic and you turn that into webcam. And that is something like I'm halfway through that process because I have almost all the things I need except the, a good, the proper lens to get this distance. Uh, but that would be the best way to get a webcam, to get video footage uh, for video calls. Not everybody can do that. That's a lot of work. I don't know. Have you considered doing that, Dan? Do you know what? I looked at, because we, we about a year or a year or half ago, we uh, we put out a tutorial on, on yep. how to do that very thing. Yep. And I looked at it and thought, that's too much work. Too I, hard. I, I can't be bothered. It's too hard. You look at that guy, uh, I think for techie people, sure. You're like, oh yeah, sure. I'm going to get a desk mount. I'm going to get a battery that plugs into <laughs> the wall to give my camera unlimited juice time. I'm going to get like a short lens, like... You gotta get a lot of stuff. You can't really yeah. travel with it. Uh, the the Opal and most webcams. The joy of those things is that you can move it around. You just it's one device. You could travel with it. Um, yeah. So I don't know. The 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 Dell Concept Perry 
seems really cool and uh, hopefully it ends up being like a shipping thing of some kind. I don't know what's going to happen with this. Like, would you buy one, Dan? And what would be your price threshold on this thing? Do you know what? If I was if I was video conferencing every single day, yeah. Um, given that it's an accessory, and I'm always loath to spend a huge amount of money on accessories because I, you know, it's that thing of you, you lose it when you change computers. I would say you know, 199, 200 dollars is probably sure. sort of where I would go. But mm -hmm. you know, um, it would need to it would need to be that sort of one. I buy yeah. it. And that's my solution for that's your solution several years and a webcam yeah webcam should last you like five years i think like yeah. there's a reason we haven't really seen this tech change much because the sensors haven't changed much like the sony 4k sensor that was like the biggest new leap for a while uh, but even then people don't need you don't need 4k on your webcam what you need is like no you, no, you really good don't. light also, capture yeah mm -hmm. um i mean most platforms compress the hell out of the feed anyway yep. so it's not as if unless you're Mm -hmm. Unless you're streaming, which I would say is a different use case. If you're streaming, mm -hmm. do not buy a webcam for your kind of your single solution. When you're streaming, you buy a streaming setup. You buy well, you, yeah, yeah, or you do you know? the DSLR. Um, yeah. The the good thing about 4K sensor is that you can like crop in a little. So if you're in a yeah. cluttered room, if you can't like find the right spot, then at least you can crop in and still get like a decent 1080p image. Uh, anyway, that thing seems cool. Uh, Dell also showed off a Concept Luna laptop, which it just looks like a laptop. But I think what's really interesting is what's inside of it. Um, they basically rearranged the hardware so that it's more repairable and it's uh, easier to like recycle when you're done using it too. So uh, they say it has 10 times fewer screws, a deep cycle battery, bio-based circuits. I'm still unclear what that means. I think it's just like, uh, more, you know, there's flax fiber uh, in in some of the PCBs, just a lot of things here that can, I think you can throw it away and not have to worry about like weird metals going into your bin. Uh, any thoughts on the stand? Because I know you, you also checked out that uh, modular laptop, right? I was going to say, yeah, yeah. Um, this has been an area of interest for me for a long while. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I'm fairly sure that when they started talking about bio-based <laughs> materials, they just watched a lot of Star Trek Voyager and got carried away. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, Dell's always, of, of the big manufacturers, Dell and Lenovo and, and HP as well, they've always been better than a lot of the other manufacturers. But yeah. certainly I think, um, you know, Framework, who this year released um, the sort of the, the almost fully modular repairable laptop, you know, it's only a couple of screws to get into it. I would consider myself to be a sort of terrified novice <laughs> when it comes to yeah. taking stuff apart and you know they said feel free this this should be so easy that even you dan mm -hmm. can't mess this up <laughs> and i was able and the thing is not only was it is it designed to not be intimidating and easy but it's also really quick i was able to change mm -hmm. the keyboard unit in two and a half minutes great and great. about 50 seconds of that was me struggling because i didn't realize the screws were captive and so therefore I was trying to pull it You were out. like, you kept screwing. Yeah. Yeah. Are those, um, I feel like removing things on laptops, the big thing is like people strip screws all the time. Are they using like better screw sizes to make it easier to actually use a normal screwdriver and stuff? Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. I think, um, I want to say there's only two different screw types and they, okay. um, and most of them are like a standard, standard size. Don't ask me mm -hmm. what it is off the top of my head. <laughs> that I think, that I think is the key the key discussion about repairability that lots of people forget is that it's mm -hmm. not about, is it repairable? It's, is it repairable for the general consumer? This right, is something that right. annoyed me when um, Apple said they'd start releasing right. um, aftermarket or, you know, sort of official spare parts for um, the iPhone. And they were making a big song and dance about it. But also I don't think people would necessarily feel comfortable pulling mm -hmm. that display you know novice users would feel comfortable pulling the display off yeah, so with the dell yeah. um i mean i would say this is where the industry needs to be going now in terms of making sure this stuff runs for a long while if dell can do this mm -hmm. and they can do it well i mean it does look as if they've they've had to sort of rethink where the components yeah. go put them all in a more logical place it certainly make more room for that big beefy battery because that is a big battery. That's a big battery. Uh, a I do really get, like battery. a lot of these companies have, especially Dell, has optimized to <clears throat> make things cheaper to build. You know, not mm. necessarily for uh, to get back in there and repair things easily. So 
maybe this could have an effect on price down the line. But you know what? We are still in the middle of the global chip shortage. And uh, <laughs> it means bad things. It means yeah. especially you'll probably have to be using your hardware for a very long time. So, hey, if you're feeling like your computer's slowing down and uh, you have something that you can actually plug more RAM into, now's a good time to do that because uh, you'll get more life out of your machine. This may be we, This may be the way we have to live for, you know, for the foreseeable future too like sure there and we're going to talk more about this in the future um but you know chip companies are still struggling to produce supply more foundries are being built but it's going to be like three to five years before we can actually see the fruits of that labor so hey folks uh love your hardware take care of your hardware because you're going to be stuck with it for a while and if you when you need to upgrade you'll either have a hard time finding things in stock or um you know, end up paying a lot more for it. So the idea of something like Concept Luna, I think is pretty cool. It's pretty cool to have like something that's more repairable and more recyclable. Any further thoughts, Dan? Like I know you've been thinking about this stuff for a while. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, what I would say, I think Framework deserves a big chunk of credit purely yeah. for pushing the conversation that way. It was going that way. Mm -hmm. But I think um, uh, the guy, N Nirav, the, the founder, um, basically said, you know, he's not intending to try and conquer the PC market. It's essentially mm -hmm. he's out there at the very fringe building a device that then will force everyone else to reconsider what they're doing. And mm. I think the fact that Dell are now doing this sort of speaks to the fact that um, the conversation is changing. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm looking forward to, you know, two or three years down the line when we're not throwing away when we're not throwing away all of the laptop components that we you know there's lots of stuff in a laptop that you're you know when you throw away your old version or you recycle yeah. the old version there's plenty of stuff in there that's not you're not getting an upgrade on you know once mm -hmm. you've got your 4k display or, or even uh, an hd display for most uses that's fine you mm -hmm. don't need to replace it until you burn it out same with things like the io and the speakers stuff like that it, it's just waste it's needless waste so mm -hmm. just eliminate that <laughs> i'm right there take. I'm right there with you, <laughs> and I, I think we all, we could all use something that's a little more repairable. Yeah. Uh, moving on to another story, too. Just quickly, I want to mention that uh, we saw that Apple had removed mentions of uh, its controversial CSAM uh, material, or it's like CSAM approach, and that's stuff around child sexual abuse material. Uh, we talked about a couple of months ago that they were going to start, uh, they were going to enable a feature that would scan your iCloud photo libraries for uh yeah, things I, I believe like things related or known uh known material within csam databases that could be related to child sexual abuse and it seems kind of useful and trillin and i dove into this it also seems like it could be a huge privacy overreach and a lot of security experts kind of uh, took issue with this when apple talked about it they have not said they're going to stop working on this but the weird thing is that they have taken um all removal of CSAM, all removal of like scanning your photos and stuff from their uh, from their website. So uh, I don't know. We don't know. We don't know <laughs> I, what's happening. Yeah. Do you know what I will say? Um, it seems like one of those instances where Apple is probably doing the right thing in yeah. terms of building the technology, and I think it's. It's an unwritten rule or an, or an unspoken sort of truth, maybe is a better way of saying it. It's an unspoken truth that all tech companies that have cloud platforms will have human moderators doing mm -hmm. spot checks and audits. The idea that, um, you know, you can upload anything to the cloud and it is and, and no one ever will be able to access it or see it is a bit of a, a, of a fallacy. And so I think the idea of automating some of that or maybe just reducing the intrusion on most regular users is probably well intentioned mm -hmm. but i think for obvious reasons when you're talking about something so serious like this and if you if you're glib about it yeah and to a certain extent you know whenever we hear silicon valley in general talking about oh we can automate it with ai it'll be fine we'll train a model and all will be well and I think we've learned over the last decade that that approach does not necessarily work well. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm I'm glad that I'm sure there's going to be more consideration put to this, and when and I'm sure it will come back eventually. And I think as long as that that's um, a lot less opaque 
in terms of the conversation than Apple normally is, mm-hmm. then I think we can have a mature conversation about it. But yeah, I'll yeah. note in, sept- in September, Apple said that they would be delaying uh, the rollout of its CSAM detection yeah. tools uh, indefinitely too. So we kind of knew they would be holding off on this. I think removing that language from the website is just like a thing to you know cause people to freak out less. But yeah, hopefully when this stuff does end up coming, like they're in touch with security advocates too, because I feel like yeah. that is, that's the big thing. There's a lot of potential for this technology to be to be overused. And uh, I want to point out a piece on Engadget. Uh, Chris Abel, a uh, frequent guest on the podcast here, uh, wrote up a piece in August called Why Apple's Child Safety Updates Are So Controversial. Um, it's worth the read to see like what the big deal is, because I do think on the face of it, hey, stopping child pornography, stopping the, the sharing of it is a good thing. But she talks about like why it, there could be downsides to this method for doing so. So give that a read as well. Can we not call it child pornography, though? We could call we could call it. I think CSAM is like yeah. CSAM yeah. is better because there's yeah. like yeah the kids don't consent so like yep there's yep yeah. it's uh it's it's not great. Uh, no. Another thing um, in other Apple news too. If you're using macOS Monterey, uh, they have finally enabled SharePlay, which is the feature that can let you you know. <clears throat> share movies and music with your friends and you know join together with friends to watch stuff uh i've not tested this out uh in a working fashion yet i've previewed monterey quite a bit uh so i'm looking forward to seeing how this works um is this something you would actually use dan like it it is a cool idea but i don't know know how how much people dig it yeah do do you know what it's it's something that um during the the sort of the the worst parts of lockdown last year mm-hmm. me and me and my one of my best friends would um buy like uh stand-up gigs <laughs> sort of on demand live stand-up gigs uh-huh. and this sounds like a very dan have... cooper thing yeah, you're completely. just like give me the rush <laughs> of going to a comedy club and not knowing if this person could be funny please um <laughs> but what we were doing was we were watching it we were streaming it sort of with mm-hmm to our TVs and then we had zoom open beside us Mm -hmm. with the volume turned down because of all the sync issues. But the idea there was so we could sort of enjoy the Mm -hmm. idea of sharing that experience. That's cool. That's cool. So if, if that process can be automated, but I think there's loads of content restrictions. So I think there are, it's only D plus and and TV plus right now that actually allow it. So I don't Mm -hmm. think, you know, the, the go faster stripe or the dice platforms that we were using, um, (laughs) unless they're going to sort of, suddenly get the budget to integrate this sort of stuff it's not going to really work for everyone until it until it can apply to every platform that's out there unless you really love disney plus shows you know i'm sure people sure. do yeah i remember when trillin was testing this too she had trouble <laughs> watching um ted lasso with matt smith and ted lasso is a show on both of our regions but for some reason, like sharing that show, even though it exists on Apple's platform in you know in the UK and in the US, watching that together with somebody across the region had was a problem. And I don't know if they ever got it working actually. So, you know, there there's a lot of things to see here. It'd be nice if this stuff was completely unrestricted. But I also understand yeah. if the uh, the media companies were just like, no, what are you doing? Like you're <laughs> you're giving away our stuff. Um, they're just so used to locking everything down. But I'm hoping this feature ends up, uh, you know, ends up working out. <clears throat> I agree. I have nothing more to add than that. <laughs> okay. Let's take a break here. Dan, do you have anything that you've been working on you want to talk about? Otherwise, we could just yeah. go straight to succession and do some Q&A. So, your uh, call. so yeah, I um, so I'd like to talk about the piece that I did that went up this morning, oh, yeah. if that's all right. Um, sure, sure. I, I went to let visit me... the, let me paste it in sure. to, the, to the secret document. Thank you. One second. Da, 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 da. Just sit tight, audience. We are we're gonna move on to this section, then we're gonna talk <clears> about the <throat> session. And honestly, we have it's 10 30 now, so we've been making good time. So if there's anything else you want to talk about and what we've been watching, feel free to throw it out there, Dan. But we will start with succession. Okay. I see what's here. Okay. I'm gonna throw to you, Dan. <laughs> thinking about investing in Revian, but uh seems like a weird like They're either either it'll go well or it'll go terribly. I'm kind They're of good waiting company. for it. Yeah. I'm kind of waiting for like the first situation where their stock mm-hmm. really takes a tumble 
so I can get something for like seventy-five dollars a share sure, rather than one hundred dollars sure. a share. Just to point out that the Engadget podcast does not offer financial advice. No, no, there is no, no yes, guarantee. Engadget does not does not uh, offer financial advice. And in fact, I've uh, invested in a couple of biotech stocks. Uh, oh, just in the last, yeah, in the last like couple weeks. You know <laughs> yeah, what? Biotech your Theranos is... bet did not work out. No, yeah, no. I'm well, sorry. it is. It isn't uh, Theranos, but you know what? <laughs> biotech is really hard to do, and those stocks are not doing well. It's uh, it's hard to do. There, there's a lot of cool stuff going on in that field, though. Okay, I'm gonna throw this to you, Dan. <clears throat> okay, let's move on to what we've been working on. Dan, anything you want to shout out on your end? Yes, indeed. So this morning, a piece of mine went up discussing uh, Arrival's new electric car. Now, Arrival uh, was founded by one of the co-founders of Yota. If your if your memories go back that far, no, the, the, the there's a lot screen. of names going on here. So what is <laughs> what is Yota? Yota was a dual screen phone back in the day. Right, before yes. That was a thing. And yes. it had an e-ink display mm -hmm. on the back. So you could do your, your um, you know, your Kindle book reading, your book reading, article reading, anything that you wanted a low power display for, you sort of turned off the main display, flipped it over, and then you could do stuff with the low power display. It was quite cool and quite clever, but I don't necessarily think it was a yeah. big hit. It was cool. Um, but yeah, Dennis, I want to say Svert Love, but don't. Please don't um, test my pronunciation of that. It's all good. Uh, then went and founded a company called Arrival. And they have been working, I think, for the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're based in the UK. They've got uh, facilities that they're building in the US as well. And their idea is to build um, large EVs. So there's a bus they're working on and a van. And the van has been picked up by UPS. And that's going mm -hmm. to be there. I think UPS have, have already guaranteed an order for 10,000 cool. UPS trucks. And the thing that they unveiled this morning, which I went to see on Tuesday, is their car. Now, rather than it being an EV for all of us, it's it's essentially designed to be the EV for rideshare drivers. So it's, it's a mm -hmm. taxi, more or less. And the idea is that it's, it's very small. It's very light. It uses a sort of woven composite uh it's not plastic but it's sort of a woven poly something composite panel so it's very light and all of the space is essentially given over to the passenger cabin um so uber drivers can poodle around cities do trips to the airport and back and it's very efficient it's very mm -hmm. light and the idea is that eventually you know um they'll be able to sell it cheaper than or at least cost cost equal to the sort of vehicles that uber drivers uh buy right now mm -hmm. and um so i went to look at the alpha prototype which i couldn't drive it around but i got to sit in it and look at it and it's mm -hmm. <clears throat> pardon me it's a very cool very utilitarian piece of mm -hmm. tech uh it's it's cooler than a, it, it's i think i wrote in the story it looks really uncool it's sort of like it, it looks like, like uh, B. It looks like eighty sci-fi. It looks like they <laughs> took that and was just like, you know, let's just round off all these edges. Let's make everything a little flat. Yeah. Do you know what? There is that. There is a little mm -hmm. bit of kind of sci-fi eighty styling, but also mm -hmm. in the same way that, like, you know, work boots are cool sure. because they're sort of anti-cool. I think mm -hmm. this has that very similar vibe where. Um, it's very practical, mm -hmm. very utilitarian, but also quite humane. There's some lovely details, you know, the all glass roof, mm -hmm. really comfortable seats. There's so much space. Like you wouldn't believe it. it it's you can't really tell, but it's mm -hmm. really tall. It's sort of got the same sort yeah. of height as, yeah. a, as a Land Rover Discovery. It's even got the same. It looks uh, very much like a Discovery, like a yep. shrunken Discovery from the back. Someone called it a, um, a, a Cyber Twingo in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> which i think says, says i can, I can see that you know? um it reminds me the height of it almost reminds me of like the new nissan uh yellow cabs that new york uh cab yeah. drivers started using and yep. the cool thing about those is that you just walk in and it's like it's not like you're scooting down to get into a car you just kind of walk in and then they have the glass roof too so you're seeing all of new york so i yeah i like that um i am i am testing cars myself especially like family cars i'm looking for like high-tech family cars uh for myself and also to write about so one thing i've noticed is man i hate it when there's no sunroof or moonroof i just i i've i've started to hate it because these cars are getting so big if you have nothing above you 
it just feels like you're in a coffin. Like you have no natural light, really. It's just, it's a really weird restrictive thing. So this is a nice feature. And it looks like this thing has a lot of cargo space. Um, Not a lot of cargo yeah. space, weirdly enough. It's 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 mm -hmm. all passenger space. The okay, With this okay. version, at the very least, there's only room for sort of two, two large and two small suitcases. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. even then, yeah. they were saying fundamentally, it might just be that we make the seats sort of pull forward a bit so that you can yeah. sort of sacrifice some of the leg room mm -hmm. to make the cargo space bigger. But I have I to say, it's yeah. so mm -hmm. comfortable to sit inside. Like you sit in sit in that rear seat, mm -hmm. and you don't feel like you're in a car. You feel like you're in. You feel like you're cool. sat on a park bench with all the room <laughs> in the world. You know, that's a that's, that's a sign that's of a good need. cab, and I feel like yeah. people in people in cities without cabs don't understand like what that vibe is like. But I, I always I appreciated like getting one of those good yellow cabs like when I could in New York. Um, this is really cool, Dan. And uh, wait, what are you driving at home these days? So I drive. I don't think there is a, an equivalent in the U.S., but I drive a Toyota Auris, which is the it's hmm. one down from a Prius. They've just renamed okay. it. Or, denamed it back to the Corolla, which is what it was before. But right, I don't know right, right. whether the Corolla in the US is exactly the same. <laughs> but it's yeah. um because you know like even when it's the same name, the US version is normally four times the size and about <laughs> half the fuel economy. Yeah. So... No, that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah. But you're yeah. you've got a RAV4, haven't you? I have a RAV4, I have the 2017 RAV4 hybrid, yeah. which is a really good car, but I am looking for something a little bigger i found really? like for trips for trips and stuff like um basically the, we did a beach trip this year um where it was just me uh my wife and my daughter and like all the beach gear that we needed we were driving it to my parents house because they have a they have a honda pilot so it's a bigger car we were all going to drive together um i had to stuff the rav4 like to the brim i had to have like uh i had to have like um beach chairs and stuff on the front seat because my wife usually sits in the back with uh, my daughter just like keep her calm for an hour um the trunk was completely full front seat was like packed i had like just like my passenger was like all the cargo next to me i was like this is not sustainable like i want to <laughs> i want to be able to do nice long road trips at some point and flying with the kid is not always great especially with covid still going around but yeah we're in an area where if I drive five hours, I'm on a Florida beach, you know? So it's like, okay, yeah. I want to take more advantage of that. So having a bigger thing I think would be useful, but I think within the city, uh, I'm really intrigued by this thing, Dan. So I hope this works out and uh, you know, uh, hopefully we're going to see like a big change in terms of transportation in general over the next 10 years. Uh, I know the Biden administration is making a big push for EVs in the U S um, I know in the UK and in throughout Europe too, like, things are moving in a good direction, but uh, yeah, that, I want it to be better. It's slow. The progress slow. is slow. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I think it's always worth mentioning that one of the big issues is always that public transport needs more infrastructure yep. and funding for the simple reason that if, you, if we just swap every sort of fossil fuel powered car for a, an electric powered car, that will not end climate change because we'll yep. still have all the issues with capacity, with the emissions necessary to power those vehicles, the emissions necessary to create those vehicles. So I think the next thing I'm going to buy is an e-bike. I'm been I've mm. been keeping my eye out for a while, and I know that I don't want to sound like a like a like a smug. When I say this right. <laughs> uh, that's just that's just your normal tone, Dan. It, like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. like they're not for everybody and they're certainly yeah. not for every single day like if it's blowing yeah. a gale outside of course you don't want to get out on your bike but there are times and instances where an e-bike makes a hell of a lot of sense mm -hmm. you know when it's dry when it's a trip under say two or three miles for sure you know when you're in a city um the size of this one if you want to get from one side of the city to the other it's easier to do that on a straight line through the main part of town with the bike than it ever mm -hmm. would be to go all the way around the ring road in mm -hmm. a car. Are you and... thinking a normal, like an e-bike that looks like a normal bike, Dan, or like a cargo bike? Because the cargo bikes are the big things that I'm seeing people really get hyped on. I have friends in like in Boulder, Colorado, which is like a mecca of like, you know, granola people and also like cool <laughs> transportation. Like they have bike yeah. lanes all th all around the city that don't even touch normal car traffic. So it's like, it's just beautiful. What do you think about doing a cargo bike or like a normal thing? Do you know what? I've looked at cargo bikes and mm -hmm. the price, I mean, the price They're of the cargo insane. bike yeah. is just so much. I mean, I think um, 
there's one I saw, which is, I think, French or Dutch, and mm -hmm. it's got a very nice sort of cargo hold with a, like a very small bench seats and straps, so, mm -hmm. you know, seat belts. So I could put both of my kids in there and take them into town very easily. Mm -hmm. um, but it's about four and a half thousand pounds, which is what if it's if it's sort of I almost always in double. my head it's sort of like almost double. double in the US. Yeah. So that would be eight thousand dollars. That's yeah. you know, I'm I'm in Germany. That's about yeah, you know, th if I was in Czech, of... you know, different story, but and it's usually it's usually people who are a little more affluent in the US who are yeah. going big on the cargo bike thing. But yeah. I've been I've been testing one e bike which has like a has a huge like um I don't know what the thing on the back where you could actually put cargo, like it has a big bench in the back. And it also has oh, yeah. space for uh, one child seat. And we've been using that during the summer. And that's been really interesting. So, you know what, Dan? We will bring you back for a transportation chat. And also yeah. for me to make fun of the Hyperloop, because I know how much you, you're just such a big fan. Such you know, a big I'm fan of the Hyperloop. A, I'm, I think you're suggesting I cover Hyperloops uncritically, <laughs> which I'm going to take issue with. But I think the whole point is it's... Yep. It's a good idea. It's a good, like just any conversation around the, about better public infrastructure is, is worth. For sure. For sure. Good. Discussion. We can have that fight. We will have that <laughs> fight in a future episode because I, I don't know if it's better, but we will see. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. Uh, let's move on to our pop culture picks. I feel like the main reason, the, like the key reason we're bringing Dan onto this episode is that succession season three, has finally ended uh, or has just ended. We are all still reeling from the finale. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the show and why I think specifically the Engadget audience too um, should be watching. I think it's the best thing on TV right now. It also directly ties into technology in many ways. Like it is all about the, on a broad level, the show is all about like, you know, the leader of a, of a large media company, like a big Fox like company and his kids who are vying to take it over or have some position of power within it. Um, and that's it. It's it's that royal drama of this very elite family and how they relate to other elite people and how they control politics and all sorts of things. Um, why should people watch Succession, Dan? Like that's that's what? the thing oh. we should start with, yeah. Why should people watch Succession? See, I feel I feel very smug. I was I was a very early <laughs> booster of Succession. So yep. I've been telling people we were to both watch were. it. We were there, we were right there, yeah. Um, why should you why should you watch Succession? It's very good, mm -hmm. I think. It is one of the it's a very smart show and it's a very fun show. And one of the things that I love about it is that it is a drama written principally by a group of British uh, sitcom writers. Yep, yep. And so whenever <laughs> you know the, you never go more than like 3 minutes without a joke. Oh man. <laughs> And so it's it's tremendously funny. It's tremendously dark. It is. It's so much fun to watch. But then there are moments like in the season finale that's just happened, <laughs> where something that that happens that's completely organic and mm -hmm. in retrospect makes makes complete sense. sense. Yeah, but it's still an utter shock when it actually happens. <laughs> you know. Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned, so Succession is created by Jesse Armstrong, who has produced, you know, some, he has been a part of some of the best British like sitcoms out there. I'm thinking of like everything with like Mitchell and Webb, that Mitchell Webb look, the thick of it, and especially Peep Show, a show Peep yep. shot entirely in first person through, through the eyes of, uh, you know, characters. That show is entirely on Hulu right now. It used to be something I had to like order, I had to get the DVDs or somehow acquire it um but now it's readily accessible and peep show is a hilarious hilarious thing um it is wild to me to see uh the creator of that show which is a straight-up comedy that maybe is occasionally dramatic uh is now basically like spearheading one of the best dramas uh taking a direct stab at like american excess and american culture too like it is it, it is fantastic I think from the cast, uh, Brian Cox, uh, Kieran Culkin, Matthew McFadden. Um, we were talking about this before the show, but Matthew McFadden is the strangest person to see cast <laughs> as the like dopey Midwest guy who doesn't quite belong with the elites. Because if you've been watching movies, a movie or TV, um, certainly British like stuff over the last like 
20 years, you'd recognize him as the lead of MI5. He was basically the British back ba uh, Jack Bauer to a certain extent. Yep. Um, he was the British Jack Bauer. He was the star of Ripper Street. So he was yep. the... Did you get uh, Ripper Street was on Amazon, I think. It was, was on Amazon. Amazon. I never Street. checked it, but I, I did see that it seemed like, yeah, it was an interesting role for him. Uh, I also know him from Joe Wright's excellent uh, Pride and Prejudice adaptation. And I love yep. Joe Wright. And he is he's like Matthew McFadden's fantastic in that. Anyway, strong cast. Um, this show treats swearing and like just like people using colorful language like an art form. And I think yep. that's the that's the big thing. Get past the pilot. Maybe give it like three episodes if you have not seen any of it, because I think the pilot the pilot in particular is really, really bleak. Like there's some bleak, like rich people privilege stuff happening there, where it's like, oh man, I hate all these people, and why would I watch anything about them? Um, but you know a what? couple episodes in, you're like, okay, now I'm on board. What's up? It's it's <clears throat> to to be really stupid. Do you remember um, uh, Jamie Lannister at the very start of, of Game of yep. Thrones, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. I guess is the thing now that we can use as an example because <laughs> A, that show's ended, and B, everyone in the whole world pretty much watched Game of Thrones, whether they wanted to or not. And so you start with a character who is, who's a two-dimensional villain and then isn't even humanized, but certainly you spend time with this character and the, the portrait of them is, fleshes out and keeps fleshing out. And you become you become invested in their journey, even if they are also a really bad person. Yeah. And I think Succession is essentially a show about twenty Jamie Lannisters because everyone, <laughs> it's everyone the entire there family, yeah, has has dirty fingers. Dirty they fingers. Are, they they are have the most killed people. Wealthy. They, they are disgusting. People. Yeah. Yep. I mean, they are also, um, you know, they are running a media conglomerate that is not doing good things. And certainly there is, a, there is a moment in the third season, which I won't spoil, even though it happened several weeks ago, mm -hmm. in which they, you know, they make a deal with someone who is tremendously odious. And they essentially promise to mm -hmm. put the whole weight of the conglomerate behind this utter expletive deleted. <laughs> and they're very fine with the the sort of the immorality of doing so. Mm -hmm. uh, but I will also, say, yeah, that's season three brings in a lot more guests, like a few more guest stars, and specifically, I think Alexander Skarsgård, who appears in this season, is basically a cross between Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey, like. No, he's, no, he's Daniel Eck. It's it's a cross between Zuckerberg and Daniel Eck. We don't we don't really so we don't really hear much about Eck over here. Um, but okay, okay. I, I I hear I hear that. Like we don't hear <laughs> the stories about like Eck's humanity or lack thereof over here. Eck is the uh, the head of Spotify. He is. Um, a... but Skarsgård plays this tech bro, basically a guy behind a big streaming technology company who is just like above humanity. He is almost like um, what's his face uh, from Watchmen. Manhattan. Oh um, yeah. He he is sort of like all these humans are beneath me. Everything going on in this world is like I don't need to care about, but what I care about is, you know, building this giant uh empire and his uh his approach to it, his inhumanity, I think is just kind of fascinating to watch and Skarsgård is the guy where it's like, yeah, we've seen him be vampires. We've seen him be like genuinely evil people. And this to me feels the most chilling because it's like I see reflections of the billionaire tech bros who are currently basically running our world now. Did you him. notice mm -hmm. also that as a, as something that that passed almost completely, I think, unnoticed and unremarked is that he is this sort of emotionally unavailable money obsessed monster. But mm -hmm. also he does love a uh, can we can we say the S word? Should I say poop sure, post? Sure. He does love he does love a shit post that man. And, you know, there was lots of consternation when he started uh, shit posting on Twitter. And I just wonder whether there are other um, slightly dodgy billionaires who uh, who also crave crave the appeal, the slightly it's parasocial true. appeal of people on Twitter. It's he, mean, he is I'm a saying weird nothing. say nothing. He's a weird hybrid of like the worst of all the major tech bros right now. I think that's yeah. the main way to put it. Like he, he, he's a bit of Zuckerberg's like blank death stare. He's a bit of like Musk's like uh social tanking like so using social media to either tank or increase the value of their company based on a single post it is yep. it is absolutely wild anyway people um I, I i think the main takeaway here is watch succession if you, if you are listening to this podcast you should probably watch it 
the people are terrible, but I think the core of the show is like how their awfulness, um, they'll ne basically never get to be happy. And I think <laughs> there is some enjoyment in watching these like rich elites just basically suffer through life. Um, anyway, that's also, what that's I find. the synopsis for the Engadget podcast, right? That's true. It's absolutely <laughs> true. One other thing. I want to mention real quick, and thanks yep. to Mark Dell in the chat for bringing this up because I forgot to uh, I forgot to even think about this. But one thing that dropped last week was the Matrix Awakens, which was an Unreal Engine five tech demo, and I just want to shout this out real quick because this thing looks incredible. Did you did you take a look at any of this footage, Dan? No, is... I haven't yet. Okay. It is a, it, currently it's a PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X exclusive to show off like what Unreal Engine 5 can do on those platforms. But you can also see, um, you could see the full video in like 4K, 60 FPS on YouTube right now. Uh, it features character models of Keanu Reeves and Carry On Moss that look, no, I wouldn't say exactly human-like, but certainly like CG render level, like what you'd imagine a CG render character would look like five years ago. It's doing that in real time. Um, it has a big highway chase sequence that basically looks exactly like the Matrix Reloaded chase, except it's happening in real time. You can play it, and it looks like, um, according to a lot of folks like who've been working on that, it's actually even more um, more accurate in terms of like car crashes and whatnot compared to uh, the way they shot Matrix Reloaded, where they, wow. they didn't even have the technology to like accurately simulate car crashes and whatnot. So this thing is really cool. If you have a next generation console, I think it's worth checking out. At the very least, hit play on this on YouTube, on your TV, and just like take a look at how far we have come. And uh, yeah, like uh, this thing just kind of floored me. Um, I'll be talking more about this not next week because we're not having a show next week but we will be talking about this during the next podcast where we'll certainly talk about the matrix resurrections the next movie uh in the series and i'm very excited to talk about that so stay tuned for all of that anything else you want to mention dan in terms of what you've been watching or this matrix thing do you know what i will say unreal i think unreal engine if mm -hmm. if we're not declaring it already unreal engine is eating cinema in the next mm. sort of five years i mean i've I did a story mm -hmm. about um, Rebellion in the UK building their own version of the yep. of the ILM stagecraft platform. We now have, I think, um, Star Trek Discovery is now doing virtual sets using Unreal Engine. Please don't mm -hmm. fact check me on that. I need to check. <laughs> but obviously, ILM has used it for all of the, the Disney Plus shows mm -hmm. to a certain extent. It's all using Unreal Engine. They've got all of the assets and everything else. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's not going to be long before Unreal Engine is cinema and cinema is unreal engine i think that's that's going to be a thing that happens that's Excellent. my final that's my final thought it's your final thought we will be we'll be keeping an eye on that um mark Dell also points out the uh the unreal 5 demo also works <clears throat> on xbox series s uh i have not seen what the footage looks like on that but honestly that's a that thing was the Xbox Series S is basically comparable to the Xbox One X from several years ago. So yeah, sure, it, it should do a decent job. It probably won't get all the nice graphical flourishes. So anyway, check that out and uh, tune in for our next episode when we finally dive into the new Matrix and all of that fun stuff. I'll take a pause here and I could just do the wrap up after we wrap James, okay? Yeah, yeah. Right. so we've got some time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, James isn't in the... Mm -hmm. Uh, waiting James says emails yeah. to take a while, so we will just do Q and A. Dan, jump whenever you need to jump. Yeah. I'm gonna go jump if that's all right. Thank you very go much for, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Yeah. Shoot, will, shoot uh... Ben your audio, please. Yeah, you can send yes. it to me on Slack. Mm -hmm. I will send it to you on Slack, but let me go and get a uh, 5G upgraded first, and then I will do that. <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh yeah. All right. Cool. <laughs> yep. All right. See get you, Ben. Microchipped. <laughs> to be clear, the Engadget podcast fully supports getting vaccines. Get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. This All is right, just Dan, a joke. Thank you so much. Bye. Oh, uh, well. Hello. There. Hello. I don't know what's happening. Our, our okay, next so we, Yes, we've got our next gen ready. guest who is getting ready. But while we're figuring that out, um, we have a couple of uh, comments. Um mm -hmm. There are some people. Oh, I need to go back and see. Um, John HT says hi from Malaysia. Thank you. Um, Gabriel, who is becoming a regular, says hi from Tucson, Arizona, United States. Hello. And where is the person from? 
there's there was someone else i think it was from oh it, mark harvey says hi from south africa love that oh. we've got like 10 different countries here love it um, but love it. mark dell also um was talking about whether or not you think there will be gaze fixing software on this um, mm -hmm. new Dell webcam? It's so the whole point is that you're going to be looking at that camera. I think that's the thing. So we've actually seen on the iPhone, I think some other like platforms right now, Apple has been using like uh, basically algorithms to shift your gaze up so that you're looking directly. It looks like you're always looking at the camera or you're making eye contact with people. This, the Dell thing is all about just putting that camera down at eye level. So like I'm right now, I, I've lowered my monitor to my desk enough so that my camera is pretty much eye level. Um, so you, you can make it work without the computational aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, James, are you, can you hear us? Good to go. Love your setup. Can hear you. Hello. Excellent. I did have and we can hear and see James. Panic. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I love your, we got to get you more on more often, James, because you have the cleanest uh, audio setup that I see here. Yeah, you, ha you have an SM7B. You have a beautiful background. Are you doing a lot and, of podcasting uh, or are you just like set up to record in general for fun? I, I kind of have a microphone fetish. Uh, I hear you. You can see. I, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I do record stuff. Um, I just like the idea of it more than anything else. I seem to, yeah, it's kind of the you. gear that, that, that <laughs> appeals to me most. Um, so I, here uh, I hear you. I think I have a speaker fetish. Like I love the way, I love the look and feel of many types of speakers. And it goes back to, I don't know, classic stuff looks good. I want one of the old, um, what's it? One of the old pokes with like the, the grid box the grid like box uh foam in front like i want to get one of those at some point mm -hmm. I want some old eclipse speakers this is this is us in gadget you so gotta anyway, get two bams two bams two speakers. speakers yeah, well, yeah. We, we've all become our dads basically <laughs> it's, 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 true it's basically true. that it's basically that like that is that is like that is culture anyway welcome james true editor at large adding gadget to the podcast uh we we've been talking about getting right you now. on the show for like yes months and months and months you, you never do it, so... Hey, <laughs> hey! There have been attempts. Maybe not... I maybe I not I really followed through I, attempts, but there have been attempts. I like to tell myself, I keep myself uh, exclusive, but that's obviously just me lying to myself. It's all good. So okay, we're in the so middle James, of Q&A are... right now. Do you, want, do you want to do some Q&A, Ben, or do you want to just hop into it? Uh, I mean, we've only... Uh, mostly, they haven't been direct questions yeah. to... Um, things that we were talking about it's just talking about the talking. whole idea you know like mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about um why ev charging ports aren't more mm -hmm. um easily found and i was actually saying that like my dad is a um one of the lead planners for my hometown and so i keep telling him like <laughs> if there is any place that is trying to build a new parking lot or like upgrade their parking lot mm -hmm. some um, you know, property developer or something, I just like require them to put in EV charging points For because sure. the world will catch up with you sooner than you think. Sooner. Or certainly like any town center parking lots, like right now in my my little suburb outside of Atlanta, like we have a small town center, but there are like 10 Tesla charging spots and then like 10 other like uh, whatever Charge America. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, one of, one of those other ones. Like, so we have a bunch of spots here and just for electric cars. I don't even think people, there are that many electric cars in the uh, community, but we have a ton of spots, so it's all good. Yeah. But we could give James some time to warm up too while we're here. Yeah, true. Um, yeah. And it, like the big thing that we ended up talking about is whether or not there is a standardization for EV charging points. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I mentioned was that um, Tesla opened up its patent for its chargers. And mm -hmm. I think like, you know, that was not just um, them being magnanimous. It was not them being generous. It was them hoping that they become the standard for everyone. And maybe they will, maybe they mm -hmm. won't be, but I, we're not nearly at that inflection point yet. We're, I, can't, I think we're getting closer to it, but we're not yep. at that point yet. I mean, there, there's the whole thing of like level one, two, and three chargers. It's just like cross compatibility between those voltage compatibility and just general software issues. I think that was the thing when uh, 
Ford launched the Mustang and like the Mustang EV and whatever, like the charging platform that was using the US was like very confused and didn't know how to always charge that thing properly. So it's all good. Okay. So cool. James, are you recording or can you start your recording? Mm -hmm. I just did. So it's a good, good job you mentioned that because it did totally yes. forget. But, uh, yes. Okay. Excellent. Okay. All right. So if you are recording, then we can resync. So mm -hmm. I'm going to count down from three at the end of three. Everybody, like, clap your hands or snap mm -hmm. your fingers. Helps me figure out where the files start. And chat, if you want to clap also. <laughs> Please clap. Um, that's always cute. The clap heard around the world. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So syncing in three, two, one. Okay. Let's do some silence so I can get some room tone. And we are cool. figured out. Let's talk about this Game Boy that's not a Game Boy. <laughs> the Game Boy that's not a Game Boy. I didn't, yeah, don't yeah, call I, it a Game Boy. Don't call it a Game Boy. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. I apologize. <laughs> Let me. So I'm going to reintroduce the segment for the audio. And I'll reintroduce you, ben, uh, James. So just uh, bear with me as we do all this stuff. And yep, we'll definitely get you up by 1130, OK? OK. <clears throat> Let's move on to our first segment, which is all about the analog pocket. And joining me to talk about that is our editor at large, James True. Hey, James, how's it going? How's it going, Devendra? Thanks for having me on. I'm pretty excited to talk about this. So um, yeah, good to be here. I know. I, I know you're excited because I also know you're our resident like portable gaming, um, <laughs> retro portable gaming nerd. Like you were, you were just all up in there. You're always up with your. Um, is it links? Is what you're so really links always? is yeah. that's the thing I went all in on. Yeah, um, I did my I, I did 15 year old Mia solid, and then <laughs> once I earned enough money, I just bought the entire thing. I barely play it, but but I own it. So I remember so I see are. I see like you occasionally showing off your cards and everything, and I just think like, man, I remember hearing about the links in the early 90s. Uh, it seemed fine, but I also it also made me think like this guy just loves his portable gaming. Um, Let's talk about the analog pocket. What is this thing and what makes it so different from all the other like retro portable gaming systems we've been seeing? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question because I think what a lot of people don't realize, I mean, you see a lot mm -hmm. of these sort of retro gaming machines and the, the most typical thing when you get a, like a handheld is either going to be some sort of retro pie in a case mm -hmm. or... It's going to be one of these sort of, uh, if you go on Amazon and you just search for retro gaming handheld, you're going to get a bunch um, come up. Like there's brands like Anne Bernick, uh, which are, uh, no one's ever heard of, but they're kind of a, one of the bigger names in this space. And they, mm -hmm. they just kind of do this. They're all software emulation, right? So mm -hmm. um, you've got uh, the RetroPie, um, uh, RetroArc, and all the libretto stuff. And they just put all those together. And then you sort of play the games through that, right? This, what this does is they're very different. It's called FPGA, which is Field Programming Gate Arrays. Arrays, um, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And it's basically, as I understand it, it's, a, it's basically a chip that you can configure to represent or present itself as old or other systems, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it can reconfigure itself. You get these things called cores and you load the core into it. And it suddenly it's this machine, and then you can load another core, and it's suddenly it's that machine. But what that means is it presents itself to the game, and this is the important thing here: is the physical cartridge that you do need to put into the thing. Mm -hmm. And the, for all the cartridge knows is is it's inside an original Game Boy. Sure, or, it has no clue like what it's plugged into. Yeah, right. But the key difference there is that you do have to play with uh, original games, so you need the physical cartridge to to play it. So. For a lot of people, that's a bit of a turn off, I think, because mm -hmm. you kind of you need uh, you either need to already have the games like I do, or mm -hmm. um, head down to your local retro store and you're going to spend a bunch of cash because retro games are, have sort of reached a stable price, but they're yeah. not cheap. Um, so that, that's in a nutshell, that's what it is. It's basically the most authentic way to play uh, retro games, retro handheld games. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in a portable that you can uh, that you can do right now, so it's yeah. as if a Game Boy was made in twenty twenty one. I kind of I kind of love it. Like I I love so I've pre ordered one. I don't mm. think I'm going to be playing many of these games, and also 
I have this thing about like, especially eight bit games. Like I was there, guys. Okay, most of those NES games, especially most of the Game Boy games, they weren't good. I don't want to play them again. But there were certain experiences that I would totally be down for, especially like uh, Game Boy Advance titles. Uh, something like uh, Final Fantasy Tactics um, Advance. It has not been re released in a good way. I think so. This would be the only good way to play it. And to quickly like just hone in on the FPGA thing. We've been hearing about FPGA chips for so long. And the the idea, right, is that they could be fully reprogrammed to essentially copy those old platforms. Uh, and that means it's not doing software emulation. And that is the big deal because emulation is what kills the experience of older games, right? If a game, if you're playing, if you have a Switch and you go back and play the Super NES titles or like the Genesis titles and stuff, and especially the uh, Nintendo 64 games that just hit the mm -hmm. Switch Online platform, the emulation on those things can be wonky. Uh, Zelda, uh, you know, Ocar Ocarina of Time looks completely different on the Switch because of the way the software is trying to like pretend to be a Nintendo 64. The key here is like, at the core level, at the CPU level, you could just like make a thing that is essentially replicating the chip in those older consoles. So what you have here is like a completely accurate gameplay experience, right? Like, have you noticed any differences, uh, James? Uh, yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. So uh, I, I believe was it um, who did the review for the PlayStation Mini? Um, uh, that, that was me. Your, that was me. Andy? Yeah, because that is a really good example of this because. Yeah. You, you mentioned two things there, Switch um, for, the, for the NES titles, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm talking about the PlayStation Mini. Now, both of those are official products made by those exact companies that, mm -hmm. that make those games, but they've offered a sort of somewhat subpar experience, in, uh, particularly with, with, in Sony's case. Um, well, I mean, it's maybe not subpar, but it really was just a box with an emulator and you, that you can do on many other things, right? You're just paying yeah. money for the fact it looks like an old PlayStation. But for me, what the problem really sort of occurs is that these things stack up. So the, the, the very core of software emulation is, is often something like libretto and things like this. And then you have RetroArch on top of it. And then you have Emulation Station on top of that. So you've got these three layers of open source software. Mm -hmm. And then... The hardware you're playing it on, which could be literally anything, could be your phone, could be your desktop, could be, um, you know, any one of these semi-dedicated uh, handhelds. And there's just so none of these things were made together, so they're all, mm -hmm. you know, you've got these layers of abstraction. You're getting further away, and so you can have configuration glitches. And um, you know, it's very well known that certain emulators are better for X, and then others are better <laughs> for Y. But uh, do I want to change the emulator every time I'm loading up? No, I don't. You know, mm -hmm. I want to just put turn it on so what you get with this is uh, you know it's i suppose it's a bit like trying to run um mac os on, on a windows machine you can do mm -hmm. it but why, why would you ever want to um and it, it'll be functional but it's not as good as if everything's vertically integrated and i think that to me is really the key here it really is a vertically integrated machine everything runs everything everything in that in this pocket was designed and built by mm -hmm. the same company so of course everything is highly tuned and I know they're, they're really paying attention. For example, I bought a really shady uh, 108 games in one, Game Boy Advance thing, <laughs> right? Yeah. I figured, like, screw it. I'll just, like, get this thing and I'll, I'll see what it does. And it actually didn't work in, in, in the pocket. Now, I contacted them, but, but it worked in a, an original Game Boy Advance. Mm -hmm. So I contacted them and they were like, can you link it to us? We're going to buy it and we're gonna, they're going to take it apart and figure out why it doesn't work. And then they're mm -hmm. going to make it work. And they did that with something else. Mickey Mouse on a Game Gear was one of the games I tested. And that mm -hmm. crops in in a weird way, which I guess is probably something to do with the Master System slash Game Gear um, tierness. And when I told them about it, they said, actually, yes, we know about that. We've already implemented a fix. So they can actually, at a per game level, mm -hmm. do, do these sort of things. And, and their whole shtick is authenticity. So... You know, I'm not trying to sort of, you know, sing too much of their praises, right? Because, you know, there are a lot of people <laughs> in this thing. It is, it is a premium item. It does cost $220. It's a lot more than if you're buying something from Amazon. You can pick up something, you know, a bit shady, but it's going to be like $60 sort of thing. So it's over double that. But you are paying for, for a, a beautifully integrated thing that just is a, from top to bottom is just a really coherent system. Gotcha. And one one thing worth mentioning too, it's not just the FPGA stuff. It's like the screen on this thing 
sounds incredible because it is yeah. it is a small screen it's a portable screen but it's still it's a higher resolution than those other systems like any of the older systems but they implemented things to make it look like like the imperfections of the original well, systems is that the thing yeah well that's their messaging they're they're, yeah. they're always like we replicate these screens quirks and all and it's really hard to un unpick exactly what they mean because you could argue that, oh, the FPGA is replicating the whole system, so any of those quirks, but I don't think it works like that because any of the quirks could have been at the sort of circuit board level or sort of radio interference. I don't know. There, there are things that won't happen in, in the FPGA. Mm -hmm. But what they did do is, for example, the, this, the resolution is exactly 10 times what it is on the, the original Game Boy and the original Game Gear. So every, everything right from the, off there, you're set up perfectly just for a 10 times scale. Mm -hmm. It's six. 615 ppi mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy that's too, like too many too many ppi right? yeah. <laughs> it's it is too many it's like such a nerdy stat but uh -huh. it, but um but it's way above like the the top iphone iphone 13 is about in the 400 low 400s mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. so thing so they they're able to sort of really dial it in like this you know there's just those those sort of things that really sort of add to it and that vertical integration i was talking about earlier there's mm -hmm. no mismatch between these things. Have you played much on stuff like um, Retro Pie or Retro Arch? A little bit, like a little bit. Like I, I've never been, I've never fully gone in on any of those devices just because I haven't been fully satisfied with the emulation. But the minute, like I saw your preview and I saw this thing and we also know like Analog has been doing, they've been doing a lot of devices like this too. Like they have produced FPGA driven uh, consoles as well. And yeah. people like them. They're very expensive, but people mm. like them and they work properly. And I'm at the point where I'm like, you know what? Yeah, give, give me some nice mm. hardware yeah. I can hold. Uh, I do have a pile of old games somewhere, especially Game Boy Advance titles. So it's like, yeah, I, I want to bring those back. I want to go to game stores and pick up some titles again. Um, my question for you, James, who is this thing actually for? Is this thing for yeah. like a new younger gamer who wants to feel those older games in their like pristine way? Or is it for people like us who grew up with these things and can't let go? Um, yeah, it's a really good question, actually. Yeah. So if someone was saying to me, I want to buy a retro gaming um, mm -hmm. thing, I want, it, I want it to be portable, you know, and uh, what would you recommend me? And I, I don't know if I would definitely off the bat recommend them this. It depends on who I'm speaking to. But if it's someone that just wants to dive into Tetris and uh, maybe some of the old like um, Castlevanias and, and things, mm -hmm. like that, I feel like there are other ways that if you're just going to be semi-casual about it, um, there, there. This is maybe not the way to go because mm -hmm. I feel like this is hardcore enthusiasts for sure. Mm -hmm. um, people that are uh, purists about like uh, their their whole experience, like someone who who wants, the, you know, the best headphones and really good, you know, this someone that really appreciates that sort of fine grain mm -hmm. detail. Definitely go in for that. Younger gamers, I think, why not? If you love, if you've sort of picked up some older titles somewhere and you you've enjoyed them and you really want to get into it, I think. 100%. I definitely feel that there's a threshold you need to be above yeah. in terms of your care levels. Um, because this thing doesn't do uh, anything else. It's not a media <laughs> player. It doesn't have a touch screen. It doesn't even it doesn't have Wi-Fi. There's no there's no like um a extra stuff. If you go, if you look at all these sort of Anbernic um mm -hmm. the retro ones I was, I was telling you about they they are hardcore specs. They're like we've got quad core and it does all this, and they're just throwing all this. This yeah. is none of that. This isn't about the stat war. This is just pure. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a purity, I guess. It is the sort of word for it. So I feel like it's mm -hmm. you know, maybe people sort of that were there the first time around and, and are pretty into their games. Yeah, um, this, this is the sort of one to go for them. But I would definitely say try out retro gaming handhelds first. Because just to see if you're going to put it down after a couple of weeks, <laughs> right? Yeah, um, this thing—it's a commitment. You can't easily return it. I think like it's—it's it's one of those things, and also you can't easily buy it. You can't easily buy it. Buy it. <laughs> the pre-order waves are going into 2023, from what I see on their website. Oh, so. Already, and it's just yeah. ridiculous. I'm hoping that's just yeah. a temporary thing. That while they're they're sort of overwhelmed with it, with this sort of wave of orders, but 2023 already. Um, if you want to pre-order this thing, oh, not pre-order, it's, oh, it's, it's thing. also it is selling for two hundred and twenty dollars, which is uh, that's a pretty penny. It's that's twenty dollars more than they were originally aiming for, uh, because of like the supply chain impact. Again, global the global chip shortage strikes again, uh, kind of like getting us at these things. Um, just real quick, James, like how does this thing 
feel you've you, you know you've held portable gaming systems for so long yeah um does it feel durable do the buttons feel clicky enough like uh did they get everything right in your experience yeah for, for the actual pocket itself um i think it feels great it feels exactly like what um if i spend 220 dollars on something this is mm -hmm. what i want it want it to feel like it's got a sort of scandinavian -y design that I, I you know that's sort of matte black and or white if you want to get it and that just one little pop of color but the, the buttons feel pretty good. I'm not a huge fan of the shoulder buttons aren't quite, mm -hmm. they're a little mm -hmm. spongy, but um, unless you're getting really heavily into the Game Boy Advance stuff, then you're, you're probably not going to be too worried about that. But they're also, I mean, they're totally fine. It's just, it's the, the, the only sort of nitpick really is, is on those. Mm -hmm. The D-pad's fine. It plays better than the original Game Boy, which isn't necessarily saying yeah, much. That's but, not you know, much it feels, yeah, that's not much, It doesn't have the air in it. You know, you can't, there's no crease. You can't like um, squish good. it. And I've got another good. one. That there is definitely you can if you sort of give it a, a pinch you'll feel it sort of <gasps> breathe in and you know and there's obviously a lot of there's a big vacuum inside of it so in terms of hardware it's mm -hmm. this is definitely their strong point it's it's absolutely mm -hmm. delightful and it's a talking point people will see it in Alaska I recently when I, I was yeah. reviewing it I took took it away went on a weekend away with some friends and we're like up in the mountains beautiful countryside but everyone's playing this thing because they've seen it on the table and everyone's just sort of naturally drawn to it and everyone yeah. No yeah. one, no one. You don't need to explain it to anyone because <laughs> uh, that it's literally just a Game Boy that they were playing twenty five mm -hmm. years ago, or, or or whatever it is. So in is terms it, of hardware, definitely mm -hmm. good. Is it an all metal case or is it plastic and stuff too? Um, you know when you get those brushed um, mm -hmm. plastics and you're like, it's not yeah. cold like metal. So I, I, yeah. I guess this is me saying that I don't know. It's pretty. It's definitely plastic on the back. Mm -hmm. and they've done a pretty good job on the front it, it wouldn't bother me either way if you know what i mean it feels it's got a nice matte finish mm -hmm. um yeah it's definitely a, a really good looking bit bit of kit it looks sure. good it, it reminds me of like classic sony hardware too where it's like i just want to hold that i just want to like hold and touch this piece of kit because it looks really cool um <laughs> do, do, does it feel safe in like your jeans pocket and stuff so I wouldn't do that because mm -hmm. if I'd spent 220 bucks on this thing, yep. I've already got like, a, there's a very minor line on it. It's not a scratch, Aww. but um, you know, when you get those matte surfaces and mm -hmm. somehow you've just maybe scuffed it a little bit, it's, it's not a scratch, but I had to Photoshop it out of my photos. So have a look when my <laughs> review goes live tomorrow that um, yeah. you can, you, you can sort of see it. But um, weirdly, they, they sell an additional hard case. Um, but it's the weirdest thing because this is so well designed and so attractive, but the mm -hmm. hard case is just trans transparent <laughs> plastic yeah. and it has these two sort of clips that you have to like quite pressure in mm -hmm. to, to um, it's, it's, it's a weird thing because everything else is so well done and this it's functional, but it, you kind of, once you've taken it out of that, you have this empty two halves that you have to put somewhere. And, and that's weird. I, I yeah. don't know. Was, I was less taken and the dock as well, the dock, which you, means you can feed it into the TV. Um, is again, it's great, but when you seat the the, the pocket in it, it, mm -hmm. it can kind of, it mm. doesn't, it's not locked in. It's just got a gentle sort of, you have to push it and it will teeter. Um, it, you're not going to do that because you have to play with the controller. And, and mm -hmm. But just from a, a basic design perspective, I'm surprised. I thought they might have got it a little nice and tight and like yeah. the old iPhone, doc, um, iPhone docks or iPod docks where it, it's sort of locked in there. It just felt, had a little bit of wiggle, which... Uh, I, I can see that. How 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 does it look on the TV? Because I know like usually the like analog to digital push also introduces mm. like a whole new set of like artifacts and stuff for gaming. Yeah. Now the bigger issue really is that you're playing a game that was designed for like uh sort of what is it six one hundred sixty by right. one hundred forty four, right. and you're you're watching it on like um on a four K TV and it's like it outputs the the ten eighty. So you've right. got this thing's doing 1080 and then my TV is scaling it up or, or whatever it is. Um, so I really don't think that's your issue. Your issue is, is the fact that everything is going to look a bit pixelated when you mm -hmm. watch it on such a huge TV. Although I've had it on the projector I've got here, which is 120 inch <laughs> and I'm playing Mario Kart and it was great. So it, it is pixelated, but it, it was still so much fun. <laughs> it, you know, it, it's, uh... That is a wild future we're living in where you can play Mario Kart. Is it the Game Boy Advance one? Uh, yeah, the uh, on, Super Circuit. Okay, Super Circuit on a 120 inch projector screen. That's also the size of my projector screen. I try not to like say that because it's like when I talk about playing Halo, I'm like guys, Halo looks big. Halo big on my <laughs> on my setup right now. Uh, it's I can't imagine doing that with a Game Boy game, man. 
Well, I showed you, I think, a screenshot of I actually yeah. had the Game Boy camera in, in because it works with all those things as well. It doesn't matter what the accessory is. If it worked on a Game Boy, it will work on, on, on the pocket. Mm -hmm. And I put the Game Boy camera in, which when I, I bought it secondhand just for this review, and it still had photos on it. So the battery was still <laughs> like someone else's wow. photos. Um, but through the dock, you can put it out, obviously, into the TV and you, you have it come up. And it's, you know, it's, it's an awful camera. It's terrible, but it's kind of bonkers. To, no one would have thought 30 years ago, 25 years ago, whatever it is, that this Game Boy camera would be piping up onto, you know, an ultra short throw 120 inch uh, projector. Amazing. Sort of so Amazing. It this is, is, it uh... is kind of the future we're living in like uh hey climate change is going to destroy us all the virus is everywhere but we got our game boys back baby it's uh <laughs> right it's here's me in four bit webcam whatever it is <laughs> i don't know like don't correct me how many bits it is yeah. I, I didn't look it up but you know it's not many it's like pre vga it is it is like <laughs> a very very bad resolution this Thank is you. really really bad Thank you so much, really James, bad. for diving Not into all problem. this with us. Would love to chat with you more about all of your microphone stuff down the line. Um, yep. And j just so you know, James, like let's stick around for like a bit of Q and A, uh, so you could like show it off on the camera. But let me just wrap yep. you out of the audio right now, too. <clears throat> yeah, no worries. Yep. So, James, where can we find your work on the internet? Uh, you know, we've got you in gadget, but where else can people find you? I mean, that's a really good question. Um, I don't do. The, 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 I do a bit of uh, production for a podcast called True Spies. Um, which is uh, pretty good. It's hosted by Vanessa Kirby. It's all about spies. So I do that in my... James, how have, have you not time. told me about this before? What? <laughs> have I not told you this? I'm sure You're I've... Not... I, I... First of all, I'm in love with Vanessa Kirby. I'm in love with spies. What, do you, what are you talking about here? <laughs> so it's actually run by the New York Spy Museum as well. So it's in your huh. hometown. <laughs> um, so you check former, out former spies. hometown. But okay, cool. Oh, cool. sorry. Yes, I forget that you're, you're down in Atlanta now. Um, so that's, that's kind of the main thing. Um, I, everything else is is work in progress. Very cool. Thank you. And you're on Twitter. You're, uh, you're at on Twitter, It's yeah. True on Twitter. I, I realized that yep. was probably your original question. So uh, yeah. I'm hey, it's whatever, true man. On, <laughs> um, it's True on Twitter, which is I-T-S-T-R-E-W. And mm -hmm. on Instagram, don't follow me on Instagram. But if you wanted to, it's that it's That's True. All right. Thank you so much, James. All right. All right. Let's see that. Let's see the pocket. Yeah. Because the chat room yeah. is, show, I'm sure, yes. interested. Yeah, show no pop up screen. <laughs> when you ask me where you can see my stuff, and I'm like, "What are you talking about?" Like, what? Um, yeah, I don't have any. I don't publish anything. But yeah, True Spice, check it out. You should. Uh, you really should. I will. So, I will. This is um, colors this, are pretty is, vibrant. That looks oh, nice. It looks beautiful. So this is on the analog. Um, so the, it has different uh, screen modes. So mm -hmm, if you go, mm -hmm. if you play anything on RetroArch, you can change whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But um, they're all a bit like janky in my well, not janky, but it's a lot of work, right, mm -hmm. to get where you want it to go. Whereas this, you just um, they have the uh, analog mode, which is basically just a pixel perfect modern dis uh, display. But if I put it into so that is analog mode, which is nice and bright. Can you hold it a bit further back? Yeah, focus, try not to focus get a is weird. Yeah, with the reflection. Uh, I need to do that YouTuber thing where I put my hand up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. That actually uh, helped. Yeah. Okay, and then if I put it on single player, uh -huh. uh, single player. Sorry, this is on the Game Boy Advance mode, so you didn't see me change it, but mm -hmm. you'll see that there. Maybe you can see that there are grid lines, and it's no, a little. No, I can't. It's a little. Not with little, the webcam stuff. Well, yeah. You'll you'll have to trust me that, that, that you can see the sort of scan line type things. I um, I love that. And it's a little bit like less saturated, um, which is if you remember the original Game Boy Advance, the original didn't have a backlight at all. So... I do. I had the purple one, and I actually that was the first device I ever imported from Japan. Like I had a job in high school, and I was like, you know what? I want this thing six months earlier, and I can do it. So I had like the Mario All Stars, I think, like the Mario thing that was released at launch two, and I was playing that on the city bus, and people were all like what is that like i've never seen that before so I, I get the feeling when people see your thing here james um but yeah yeah this is what so Beautiful. this is on the this is just the the authentic game boy mode mm -hmm. and again if you're not going to see the the grid lines then you're losing mm -hmm. half of the magic because um it really is like i've got the, uh, something called a retro stone which is one of those uh, it's like a um it's a retro pie fork and it's just, it's, um, it, it represents it fine. And you can put it into this sort of pseudo Game Boy mode and it's fine. But um, 
you'll see, like I said, on the review, um, I did a little, uh, took a photo of both and did a little screenshot, like a zoom in on Mario on Super Mario Land. You can mm -hmm. just see the difference is huge. Mm. If one is the, the pixels will merge and it's fine, it's a bit smudgy. And this one, you can actually see just the tiny lines in between each pixel and, <laughs> and sort of everything. It, it's, it's a bit bonkers, but um, uh, yeah, also impressive. Although they don't work on the TV out mode. Once you do TV out, those display modes are, are all gone. You know, okay. Stuck with. I'm so, intrigued. I'm intrigued. I probably won't get mine until the end of the, of 2022 at this rate. But you know, you know I got to. I, I don't know. I, I got an email just saying confirmed. I don't know. Have a group number or a group letter or anything yet. Uh, I'm intrigued though. Like, so are you going out and like looking at more stores, James, and just like seeing if you could find any any actual games? Uh, yeah. So um, I've. It, this is not what I'm doing, but just for information, <laughs> um, this is definitely not what I'm doing. Uh -huh. But uh, flashcards are compatible with this. Um, I see. Because, mm, I see. Uh -huh. Because if they, if they, if it works on a Game Boy, it works on this. So I'm just saying that is just a, a statement That's of a fact. Thing. That's the, a thing. The, the, okay. The, the, um, flashcards do work on this, but um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I want to get back in some of the Castlevanias. I want to play Aria of mm -hmm. Sorrow. Um, which they just so, put out on the Switch too, apparently, right? I like don't have a Switch though. Yeah. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> James, true. So what? You have an Atari <laughs> Lynx. <laughs> you have the analog pocket. You have probably every portable <laughs> system up until then. You don't, yeah, you don't uh, have this I, I draw a line. It's, it's a modern console, so <laughs> I, you know I kind of. So I don't know if you. This is going to be tricky. I don't know if you can see this because I'm going to have to, the camera. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah. Wait. Love it. Uh, so you have a Game Boy camera in there? Uh -huh. Yeah, so this is like the Game Boy camera screen. Let's him I, I, through whoa! the camera. That's really um, cool. That's wild. Yeah, and it's actually because uh, you can put it onto like a more modern display mode, it actually becomes a bit more useful. It gets a bit, you get much better contrast and, and, and whites out of it. So it's like a crazy, and they're, they're, they're even supporting saves of it. You'll be able to save from the camera down into. Huh down into the SD card and you'll be able to share them. But I actually did a little video segment. So when the review goes live tomorrow, um, you'll see in the video, there's actually a little section where I do a, a stand up to, to the Game Boy camera. Cool. Um, just because you can do that now, right? <laughs> just because like, you can. Right. That, is, uh, that is very cool. That is very so cool. So during yeah. this segment, people were talking about old games, you know, whether or not you have to get the cartridges, it, Again, this is really for people who are already collecting cartridges if they want a new platform to play these games mm -hmm. on. And so someone mentioned, uh, D-Man, one of our uh, chat regulars, mentioned uh, this one-person studio called Green Boy mm -hmm. Cartridge Games. Um, they make games that, uh, you know, they end up loading into... Um, now they're their own games. Let me take a step back here. They mm -hmm. are their own like designs and um, they're indie games that are on um, Game Boy cartridges. But that seems pretty cool. Like you could, you now have a platform that you can play this indie studio's games on. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on the site right now. These these cartridges start at fifty euro. But then again, <laughs> is that surprising given uh, how you, niche it is? If you, um, yeah, I was going to say, like, you've got to bear in mind that these are all going to be the sort of work of probably one person. Mm -hmm. um, and who, and to, to build the carts and stuff like this, it's, it's a, a, always a short run. You're going to be like 500, maybe 1,000, something like this. So th these things are like, they're boutique, but you, and also, but you're supporting a, a creator and there's nothing, you know um that, that's always good right you know if you mm -hmm. can support someone in their art but to add to this thing so i just looked them up i don't know what their uh, green uh, green boy are doing but if they're making them in uh, gb studio which they might be they might, they might not but gb studio is is a popular drop and drag um mm -hmm. game maker for, for game boy right mm -hmm. but pocket actually has tied in with gb studio so you can export your game in a dot pocket format and then you can just play it off of the sd card Huh. In, um, in in the pocket. So there is an avenue for indie game developers, um, who certainly who develop in, in GB Studio, could release their game for, for the pocket um, without having to make a cartridge. So if you buy the cartridge, you can still play it that way. But if they just release the .pocket file, which is whatever their proprietary mm -hmm. format is, and if you sold it, 
on you know online for for less money because you don't need to make a cartridge there's like a direct avenue for indie gamers on, on the pocket to that is to, to have the work so that's wild and i would love to see like good. some so many indie games are also like trying to ape the old like 8-bit and 16-bit systems i do wonder if like could, could we just get some of those like straight up push down to this platform that would require more work but i would well, love to see some of that yeah uh, there, there is. I talk about this in in review as well. Uh -huh. There is. So the pocket actually has two FPGA cores. Oh, okay. Um, or chips. Sorry. So it has mm -hmm. one for for the pocket, and it has a whole other one dedicated for developers. Ooh. It's like a spare spare F FPGA, and I don't know how this is beyond my 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 skill set, but the, the whole point is that they were going to open it to developers and. So you could make a core for it to emulate certain systems. It's going to be quite restricted because it's not powerful enough to do like SNES or, mm -hmm, or anything mm -hmm. like that. But but if you can develop a core that works on that and it can play your game or huh. could, like, then then again, you'll be able to do that straight away. And Mr., I don't know if you're familiar with mm -hmm. um, or the, 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 the open source FPGA console has a really good community around it as well. Analog has a really good community around it as well. So I, I would not be at all surprised Mm -hmm. If um, we see some actual modern and, and new games find a home here, so cool, it, it's it's all possible. Very exciting. You know what? As soon as I made my pre-order for this thing, I canceled my pre-order for the Steam Deck because I'm like, <laughs> you know, I don't. <clears throat> I, I got my computer. I got all this stuff. I should have kept that Steam Deck order and just resold that at some point. Mm. But yeah, I am far more excited about like playing some of these older games, even though I don't don't like some of the Game Boy games. Um, well, it, it, yeah. you've got this to contend with as well. So this is what sure. the Game Gear um, adapter looks like. It's not, it's not the, the most beautiful uh, <laughs> experience. And from the other side, you'll see, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like that. So, so here's a question: Does the analog pocket come with the um, several adapters, or do you need to buy? Oh, okay. So the, you're yeah. paying that two hundred mm -hmm. plus dollars just yeah. for the original platform, and then you need yeah. to buy other adapters yeah. subsequently wow yeah. well so that is exactly what's happening there's no denying that but mm -hmm. um out of the box without buying any accessories you, it'll play game boy game boy color and game mm -hmm. boy advance so good you've already good. got probably several thousand games that you can play right there and even if you're game boy advance movies if you want to do that you can watch them <laughs> <I> <laughs> right yeah so um so yeah so you're right. And then you have to spend, I think they're about $30 for the adapters for Game Gear, which is the only one that's available right now. Mm -hmm. Then incoming, you've got Atari Lynx, um, Turbo Express, which is interesting because that it's is also wild. a home console. Yeah. Yep. Because the, 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 it's the same cartridges for the handheld as it is for the, for the home console. Mm -hmm. And there's one more Neo Geo Pocket Color. So that is a, that's really interesting because that was always like, it was never big in the U.S., but that system and the games were incredible. Like Metal yeah. Slug and on the pocket, yeah. Same in Europe. Um, the mm -hmm. Neo Geo was kind of what that one annoying rich kid had. Yes, um, I hated yeah, them. Uh, hated them always, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, even though there were oh, some talking good, about the Neo Geo pocket the actual, color? No, the, uh, yeah. <laughs> but the actual Neo yeah. Geo was the big system that had like the two to $300 games, right? It was an arcade. Right. Hardware, basically. But pretty much. And some of yeah. the games didn't even look that good. So, well, yep. bowling was the one I always remember. <laughs> and I'm sure it was a perfectly great bowling game, but mm -hmm. I don't know if I want to get a new Geo and spend that much money just for yeah. arcade perfect perfect bowling. But some of the beat em ups are pretty good and the SNK stuff. Yeah, Fail Fury. Was, 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 like, yeah. Was, yeah. So, there's uh, a bunch of good titles. But yeah, it, it is an extra spend, um, which is unfortunate, but. It also means, I, don't, I mean, no, I was going to try and defend it, but there's no no real defending it. It's it's an extra spend. <laughs> it's all good. So, okay. and how yeah, much good. are the adapters? I believe they're 30 bucks. Um, okay, so that's not so bad, but I mean, stock it's... will be better. Like, it won't take you a year to get it. Yeah, yeah it's additional uh, cost on mm -hmm. top of everything. But then again, if you have a large library of games yeah. on a certain platform already, you get that one, and then you have unlocked the potential of hopefully 10 or 15 that you have in that collection. Right, it, it, exactly that. Although we didn't even talk about the two player stuff because this you can play two player, huh. but but you have to you can even connect it to an original uh, Game Boy. So the pocket, um, sorry, analog sells a cable 
which is uh, like a universal adapter for everything from the Game Boy. I want to say, ironically, the Game Boy Pocket, maybe, mm -hmm. um, onward. So a uh, Pocket Color uh, and Advance. And with that cable, uh, I played two-player Tetris uh, with a friend, and they were on the uh, Game Boy Advance, and I was on, <laughs> uh, and, and I was on the Pocket. Oh so wow, anyway, and it worked. Yeah, and it, and it works perfectly. So and even um, with Mario Kart Super Circuit, that's one of the single pack games where you can play two player, but as long as you've got the cable, only one person mm -hmm. needs to have the game, and that works as well. So amazing. I had I had the game in the pocket, and it, it kind of <laughs> does whatever it does. It loads it over to the other system. And you, you play it like that. So, yeah, there are additional spends, but there's all these little cool things that keep <laughs> oozing out of it. It's just it's kind just of funny. annoying. It's funny we're yeah. doing all this work to play like these very, very old simplistic games, and you could download a two dollar iPhone arcade, you know, racing game, and it looks like it looks like years beyond it. It's funny. It's funny. Like, uh, this is kind of like the the rush towards vinyl too. You know, like people want to recapture these experiences because. These are physical things we could easily lose if we don't like take care of them, basically. Well, so, I would say yeah. the, the overlap between potential pocket buyers and vinyl collectors is is one circle. Yeah. It's um, <laughs> it, it's uh, well, no, it's not the same. It's uh -huh. not the same people. It's the same mindset, right? Same so, mindset. Are you right you, there you in the middle of that circle? <laughs> I don't actually have a lot of vinyl. I I, I think I sold it all. Um, huh. In 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 harsher times when um uh, you know I didn't have as uh, as much mm -hmm. money, and now it's it's much harder to collect because it, it's just so big and all you know the, you all the like, hipsters want them yeah <laughs> yeah i mean vinyl's pretty great but but there's in my opinion that there's that's a whole other topic i'm not gonna it's a whole other topic vinyl. okay <laughs> i feel like we're gonna have to get you back james to talk about uh I don't vinyl. Know, vinyl competing audio formats weird <laughs> weird headphones old headphones yeah, my, yes. you know, anything just like that tech hit me up Dad tech. Okay, cool. Yeah, which Thank is you so ironic because I'm yeah. <laughs> all right. No worries. Yep. I'll You're you all good. There. Can you uh, save your audio, ship it to yep. uh, Ben? And Ben, yep. he is on Slack too, or just uh, drop it somewhere over email if you need to. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll do it right now. Cool. Okay. Thank, right. Thank you, you so right. much, James. We will wrap this was... episode. Thank you. This was a joy. All right. Let us do the final credits. Let me just pull those up. And thank you. Yeah, you could go. Yes. You're free. I have a good one. <clears throat> All right. Let me do the fun the final bits here. And uh, I'll shout out the thing. I'm, I'm chatting with Jess at one. Um, I think it may still make more sense to do it at the end rather than in the middle. But okay, what do you think? Sure. What do you think, Ben? Um, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Um, if people if people want to listen to it, like it'll be there and we'll, we'll shout it out enough. Okay. <clears throat> rather than break up your usual flow and whatnot. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Thanks for joining us, folks. Our theme music is by game composer Dale North. Our outro music is by our very own managing editor, Terrence O'Brien. The podcast is produced by Ben Elman. You can find me online at, at Devendra. You can find uh, Dan Cooper online at Daniel W. Cooper, I believe. And James True is at, at It's True. That's at I-T-S-T-R-E-W. And of course, Sherlyn is still at Sherlyn Lowe and you can go bother her during her vacation. You can email us at podcastandgadget.com. Leave us a review on iTunes and subscribe on anything that gets podcasts, including Spotify. We're out, folks. Oh, wait, let me do this bit. And be sure to stay tuned to... Let me just stay tuned. Let me do... I'm going to do some audio. Can you actually put it before... And we're out, folks. All that sure, stuff. Sure, sure, yeah, sure. just resolve it. Okay. Okay. Stay tuned for our chat with Jessica Condit about her piece on Meta World. It's a great investigative piece, and uh, I really think it's worth hearing what Jess has to say about it. Uh, do you want to maybe? Uh instead of saying like meta world you know mm -hmm. say maybe the full title of the article yeah. something something do, took the money and something. run mm -hmm. stay tuned for my chat with jessica condit about her investigative piece how a vr startup took the money and ran to the metaverse it's a really interesting piece on meta world and kind of the fraudster who was running it so be sure to check out our conversation okay great cool i think we can we can wrap this unless you want to chat to yep you.
Q and A nope, for a bit. I okay. I think that we are figured out. Chat, thank you for sticking around. Thanks, uh, folks. So this stream comes to you via our video team, which is led by Kyle Mock, and which is led by Kyle Mock uh, with Julio Barrientos and Luke Brooks. But it's powered by everyone in the chat. You're the ones who make it fun. You're the ones who tell us when we've messed up or give us more information. Thanks. If you've stuck around this long, rate the show on iTunes. You know that we live in a world of algorithms. Help us with the algorithms. And really, it like helps us out more than you think. And we'll see you next week. Happy holidays. We're not doing an episode next week, but we will see you in two weeks for what is, will probably be a CES preview.